Yeah, hello everyone, and welcome to this presentation about uh, creating and detecting phishing emails using uh, large language models. As I said, I'm Fredrik Heide, a research fellow in computer science at, uh, at Harvard, and I want to talk a little bit with you about how these new large language models that are pretty popular right now can be used to trick humans and deceive humans and basically to, to hack us. If you have any questions, uh, I've included my email on most of the slides. Feel free to, to shoot me an email and reach out. I'll also be in the breakout room and I'm happy to talk more about everything uh, then. So, uh, this is a group effort. I want to quickly mention the, the team before getting started. As I said, I'm Frederick. I did a lot of work with penetration testing, everything from smart door locks, X-ray machines, uh, cars, and I even uh, hacked the king of Sweden. I'm born in Sweden, it's a bit of a fun story. I'm not gonna tell it now, but I'm happy to go into it uh, later. Jeremy is a postdoctoral fellow at MIT and a close friend. He does uh, sort of bleeding edge research in neural networks and AI, so he really is our AI expert in this. He works very closely with the development of modern large language models. Bruce Schneier, He's a security expert. He wrote a book earlier this year called The Hacker's Mind, where he, among other things, talks about how uh, these new technologies that are emerging changes the hacking landscape. Aaron wrote a book uh, last year called The Weakest Link, where he talks about why phishing is still such a big problem several decades you know, after we began using computers a lot, and we can't really get rid of it. So we have, uh, to some degree, a hacking expert, an AI expert, cybersecurity expert, a phishing expert, we merged all our competencies and uh, created a bunch of uh, fun experiments regarding AI and phishing. So is this our future? There's a lot of talk about AI, a lot of noise, I would say. And some people say that, hey, it's a doomsday, AI is going to cause a lot of trouble to us. And I think this question can be answered very quickly, right now. And maybe. We don't know, right? No one knows where this is going. But what I do know is that there's a lot of stuff happening. Technologies are changing very fast. I don't really take a debate beside in the debate. I think the research area is very interesting. Some people, very distinguished people, genuinely believe we should be quite scared about AI. Some believe it's a hype. And I want to try to clear that out a little bit. Many people talk about the future, about what can happen, anything can happen. But we try to give some sense of knowledge of what can we do right now and where are we, a snapshot at this very moment. And if AI were to cause us damage, it's very unlikely to look like this. This is from a Hollywood movie. It would probably look something more like this. We are tremendously good at fighting ourselves and hurting ourselves and doing things that are suboptimal to you know, our community of humans. And I think that, and most experts, not just me, think that if AI were to cause damage, it's way easier to just make people hurt themselves. Maybe by saying to one person, hey, you get an incentive, you get a good reward if you hurt this other per person. Or by telling a country, you get a reward if you invade or attack this other country. And that's why this research is so interesting. This is exactly what we try to find out. How good is AI at tricking people? And how good is large language models at tricking people? And I don't want to be all doomy and gloomy about this. Uh, some AI talks really sound negative, and that's not my approach. AI is a tool. Like any other tool, it can be used for good, it can be used for bad. And if we just get these security aspects handled, AI really can take us to uh, levels of prosperity that we uh, haven't really felt before. So I think we should be excited, we should have some caution in the back of our minds, but we shouldn't approach AI from a perspective of fear. It's a tool that we can use for a lot of good things. Before we get started with the work, uh, I want to clear up some definitions. Some of you are very familiar with AI and these tools. Uh, some are not, so just want to quickly go through what are these large language models that everyone talks about. And they're neural networks, which is basically AI tools that are created by analyzing vast amount of data. They're general purpose tools, these LLMs. So by analyzing massive, massive data sets, they get really good at predicting textual outcome. And they can give us text that appears to be realistic. And I want to highlight this word appears a lot, because the text appears to be real. It's not necessarily real. In the research community, a lot of people try to cite things. You get some information from the language model and you say, hey, what's the source of this? The language model will give you a source, and if you look up the source, it's most often bullshit. And it looks real, but it's not necessarily real. And that's why it's so good for phishing and for deceiving us, because it can, yeah, it can create content that are very realistic. I also want to stress that it's a general purpose. You can ask it almost anything. You can say, hey, how do I bake a cookie? 
how do I trace a bomb? How do I write a phishing email? Uh, so it's very, very general, and that's also quite powerful because you can customize the content you create. How do you talk with it? You often use AI-powered chatbots. A lot of you have heard about ChatGPT, which is a chatbot to the language model GPT. There are different versions, such as there are different versions of cars or anything, but they all work roughly the same. It's very, very easy to use them. Most of you have certainly played around with them. You just enter a prompt and you get some reply. We'll shoot it more later. But just some quick definitions to clear out what this means. What is this? Well, this is something called the V-Triad. It's in some ways similar to language models. It's in other ways completely different. It's a human model created by Aaron and our team, specifically made for phishing emails. How do you create sophisticated phishing emails? And this model is very, very small. So remember, language models are large, general purpose. This is small and specific. It's trained, so to speak, manually by, by humans analyzing phishing emails, deceptive content, human psychology, and so forth. And what it does is that it's really, really good at sort of teaching you how to create content that deceives people. And of course, we use this so that we can learn how hackers think and protect us. And I'm not gonna talk too much about psychological heuristics and biases, but I want to quickly mention them because that, that's an important part of this and the specific nature of the models. It uses three vertices or three parts, credibility, compatibility, and, and customizability. Credibility is sort of the main gatekeeper, I like to say. In the concept of phishing, we say, is this email legit? If I receive an email from Black Hat, I want it to be from the sender that I usually speak with, you know, the Black Hat logo, if there's usually graphics involved, the spelling should be good, it should look real. That's sort of the first part. And many phishing emails have this down, some phishing emails don't, we'll talk more about that later, but it has to be legitimate. The second part is the relevancy. And, you know, is this relevant for me? So if you have a really good Black Hat email and you send it to my brother, it's not gonna be relevant, he's super suspicious, why would he get that email? But if you send it to me, it looks legit, they spoof the correct sender, they say, hey, we haven't got your slides yet, you need to upload them via this link now, because you're late. I'm pretty likely to press it, because it's really relevant, it looks legit. And the last part about compatibility and customizability is that some emails are interactive. A lot of modern emails have it. Two-factor authentication prompts and so forth, and these have to behave in the way you expect it. But the summary here is that it's a small model, very different from uh, large language models, but ha it has the same sort of philosophy in what it wants to do. It wants to help you create a phishing email, in this case. And we're gonna compare them. How good is this large, massive model versus this specific model? We're also gonna tr try to combine them, uh, as I will show. So to go into a little bit more details about this language model, how do you do it? Again, I think a lot of people played around with this, and the interesting thing to highlight here and sort of the takeaway for a lot of people in the industry that we're gonna come back to is that this is very, very easy. The entire phishing landscape is about to change, as I will go into, because it's now super easy to create emails that are incredibly sophisticated. Everything we've seen until this point is basically gonna differ. Many people think about a phishing email as a Nigerian scam print or some other pretty bad email, and sometimes there can be a reason for writing a bad email, but usually they are just bad. GPT changes this. You don't need to be a native English speaker, you don't need to know much, you can enter a quick prompt with just a few data points. And this is important. You don't need to know much, but if you know a little bit, such as you know that someone is a student at Harvard, then you know, and maybe you know that they use the, the Harvard shuttle, which is the bus we have at campus. Most people use it. If you just know those few data points, it's super easy to find, you can already ask this model, hey, Create an email for Harvard students telling that the Harvard shuttle is, you know, they have updated times for the summer with a link to the top table. Bam, that's a really good phishing email. It took me one second to create. It's better than the majority of all the phishing emails we've seen until now, and it's so easy. I should mention there are some security principles in these language models. If you ask them to create a bomb or a phishing email, it's gonna say, no, that's unethical. It didn't always use it, but it does that now. This is in the early days of GPT and still in these models. People try to go around these. It's pretty fun. It's very easy. Uh, there's some games even teaching you how to trick language model into giving you the content you want. But uh, if you're not going around it, it's gonna look something like this. Now, in the early days of our study, we've been doing this for since the models came, basically, I could tell the language model, hey, I'm a researcher. I just wanna do this to help people. And then it gave me the model. That doesn't work anymore. Uh, but it's not so hard to go around. So all we need to do is change a word. And 
you can't blame them because this highlights a bigger problem. The only difference between a phishing email and a marketing email is the intention, if the email is good. A good phishing email and a good marketing email are identical. So how, how could you model sort of protect against this? It's very hard, and this whole other topic with LLM, sort of input security, that's not my field, but it's easy to go around and that's the thing we want to highlight. And you get a really good email. So with the VTRI, the human model, uh, how does this work? Well, this, the main difference here is it, it's manual. You, you get a guideline from this model, but you have to do everything by hand. You can't just get the model automatically. So you kind of need to speak some English if you want to target an English person. You need to have some knowledge about these psychological things, even if you get a good guideline. So it's difficult. And when we did this, we went through the emails we created. We manually ensured, you know, is this credible? Is this legitimate? Is this relevant for the person? And so forth. So it's much more time consuming. And I think that, that's one of the biggest takeaway here. But Let's zoom back a second. Uh, I already began talking about creating the emails because that's the fun part, but before we create emails, we have to get some background data because you can't just send out phishing emails. Some people do, they're really bad. If you want at least a decent phishing email, you need some sort of background data. Uh, so in our study, we are from academia, so we did this in an academic context, which means that you, know, you have to pass IRB approvals and all this kind of thing, and we ask students for information. So we collected a bunch of students at university, we asked them some questions such as, yeah, hey, which uh, school do you belong to? There are different schools in campus. And which, um, which stores did you recently buy something from? Or some quick things. And the interesting thing about these questions we ask is that they're super, super general in nature. I should mention we have a white paper, so if anyone wants to get the details, you can just go, uh, go and find that one and see all the questions there. But it's very general questions. I could easily have scraped them. We didn't scrape them because we didn't have permission to do that. But everyone has a massive digital footprint, and it's so easy to do. And already at this stage, language models gets really, really interesting. Because what you can create here is you can create a script. For example, say, hey, analyze all these participants that come to Black Hat. Find out on their Twitter or LinkedIn where they work. Create a phishing email that's from their company that they work at, giving them a free dinner at Mandela Bay as a treat from the company when they arrive to Las Vegas. I could do this. It's super simple. I get targeted emails to all the 20,000 people at Black Hat that would be pretty good. I actually asked Black Hat, hey, this is a pretty cool ID. Can I do this to fish all of you? And they said, absolutely not. Uh, I, th I think it would have been fun, right? I would have gotten a lot of you. But, no, but it's very easy. That's the point. And you can do this super conveniently. So we collect some information. Then we create the emails. I told about the VTRIAD. We do it manually. All this information we get, is it relevant for the person? You know, who are they? And these kind of things. We do it with GPT. Automated. It goes super quickly. We also have a control group, and the control group is just arbitrary phishing emails. The kind of phishing emails that are floating around the internet, a lot of you have seen them. I'm going to give you an example. You can see them as you know, general phishing emails. The last group is pretty interesting, vTriad plus GPT. It's a hybrid group. So we use the best practice of the vTriad, but it's still automated. As we see, and that's another takeaway. I'm going to tell you more about the takeaways later, but the takeaway is that the models are really, really good but sometimes you need to hold them in the hand, so to speak. You need to help them just a little bit. So semi-automation is very powerful. So we create a query using GPT or any language model, but we ensure that the query meets all the principles of the vTRIAD, and I'll show you examples of that model as well. So I'm not gonna dwell too long on this. They're all in the white paper, but here's an example. This is a fetch from different online archives, phishing emails that flying around. We want to include some of this just to have a benchmark, right? But it's a bad email. It's it's targeting Starbucks, which is relevant because we wanted to target Starbucks, but the language is bad, the reasoning is bad. We're going to see what the students thought about this later, but obviously not so many people thought it was good. The GPT is already much more interesting. And one thing I really, really want to highlight here is this email is easier to create than the previous one. It's very rare in any field of life where we have the situation we have now in phishing, where it's easier to create something that has far better quality. Now, if you just let it sink in for a while, it's way, way easier to create something that's way, way better. There's a pretty obvious equation that phishing attacks are probably going to get way more common and way better, I assume, because attackers are not too stupid. And this email is pretty good. The language is good. The feedback was overall positive against it. One major flaw is that it actually doesn't mention Harvard students. It mentions Starbucks, but not Harvard students. And we're going to see how we can play around with queries to change this, but it's just sometimes, again, the, and this was created early this year. The models get more stable. Now this error would happen way less frequently. 
but sometimes the models deviate a little bit. So it's good to be able to help them. But it's a really good model. The quality is great. A lot of things are good. The v triad is pretty similar. We added some graphics because we had the possibility to do that when we created manually. We shorten the text. Usually the shorter, the better. Uh, the call to action is pretty clear. Overall, I should also mention that Starbucks recently opened up campus, so the, um, they have campaigns like this, so the, the relevance is pretty high uh, for all of these categories. But overall, this is a, a pretty legitimate phishing email that's, that's pretty good. Uh, the combined approach, this is interesting. We, of course, ensured that Harvard was included in the relevancy. We flipped around the query just a little bit. So last time we asked, hey, create a phishing email offering a gift card at Starbucks. Now we said, hey, or informative email, sorry. Now we said, hey, create an informative email that's offering a gift card to Harvard students at Starbucks. That little difference made a big difference. And this email actually performed way better, as we'll see. Uh, so we created a bunch of different ones of these. I'm happy to talk and show more about them, but that's just some quick examples. And then it's about to send them. We included 112 participants. Uh, we have a quite good uh, analysis of the power of the study, which is a statistical method. So if anyone wants to read that, feel free to check it out in the paper. But it basically says that this number is sufficient for now, because it's a controlled experiment. Uh, we did a bunch of best practices to avoid uh, the spam filters. We worked with the IT department of the university, sent out the emails in batches of 10. We sent the emails in times where users are more likely to watch them. And now to the interesting part, the results. As we can see, the v is by far the best, but the v plus GPT is not far after, which is pretty interesting. And we did a bunch of different versions of this, depending on how you view the results. This is the main var version, but we have different charts as well. And in some calculations, v plus GPT actually is as good or even slightly better than v -tried. That's super exciting. So it basically means that already now, we can create emails semi-automatically, just a little bit manual input. They're almost fully automated. But with a little manual input, they're as good or better than the humans, which is pretty cool. The control group performs bad. GPT performs, it's obviously suffer from not including Harvard students, right? So it's a little bit sketchy, but it still performs decently. I should add that we included unsubscribe links in all of our emails. These were very popular, and that's also something that you can remember. Sometimes we get bombarded with email, we unsubscribe to everything, but unsubscribe is a pretty powerful phishing tool. So even if you get an email and you avoid the sort of original call to action, but you unsubscribe, that might be the real phishing target. And we got a lot of people through that way as well. Um, yeah, I should also say that GPT doesn't include graphics now, right? It's just textual. What we're working on and what you could do, which is pretty cool, is you could sort of enhance GPT with generative AI to automatically create graphical contents for the phishing emails. That's not very hard. Uh, that's something we're working on now as well. And I, I think that's, that's always going to make this just even better. So I really want to highlight that this is a sort of snapshot, a timestamp of what we could do now. This research is developing so fast. I mean, this is almost already obsolete because so much new stuff are coming. And like we, it's fun to talk about this, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about the stuff that we're doing now because it's really, you have to be very fast paced in this research area. It goes super fast. Uh, I mentioned this free text example. So we asked every student afterwards, why did you press a link? Or why did you not press a link? Like, why did you like this email? Or why did you not like this email? And here's just a highlight a bunch of these responses. For the control group, it's not so interesting. Everyone thought it was a pretty bad email. That makes sense. Someone said, hey, like, the reason loop in a Starbucks, the reasoning was pretty legit. But most people said, nah, no, this is unreasonable. It's obviously phishing. It's scam. And, and that's to be expected. For the GPT, this is what I believe is more interesting. So now people are already saying, hey, it was, like, it was actually pretty good. The language was good. Uh, the call to action is a bit sketchy, because I don't believe in free stuff. And this is really interesting, because I think that with the control group, we also had a call to action, but people didn't even contemplate it, because it was so bad, right? We see that this is just spam. We push it away. With the GPT, it sort of passes the first gatekeeper. It looks legitimate. And I mean, the people are also biased here. We're asking them to look for suspicious signs. They have the observer effect, so to speak. So they're going to be more suspicious than if they just watched the email in their inbox. But a lot of people said here, well, it actually looks legit. The call to action is a bit sketchy, but you know, it's, it's a pretty good email. It, the feedback is much better. And some people mentioned the graphics, but not too many people. So I actually don't think they're so important, but that's for another study to investigate. The v trade is also expected. This is already no knowledge, but you know, they, it's a pretty good email. A lot of people mentioned, hey, this looks legitimate. We kind of trust it. Something that I really think is funny that I didn't expect is that people are kind of hard to analyze. So some people said that 
It was a free gift card. I was super happy about this. I thought, finally, Harvard is doing something nice, or Starbucks is doing something nice. They give me a free gift card, and that made me press. Other people said, hey, there's a free gift card. That's super sketchy. I'm not going to press that. So it kind of teaches us that a one-size-fit-all approach doesn't really work here, because especially not when you interact with humans, because what you think is suspicious is legitimate for me, and so forth. So you kind of have to be customized in what you do. The combined approach is really similar to the V-Tried. People mentioned roughly the same things. It looks legitimate. Someone even said, hey, this is not overly urging to take action, but he invites me to the gift card, and I really thought that was legitimate. So in some ways, the AI is even already better than humans, because it's not pushing too hard. It's just, hey, here's a gift card. I'm not going to push you to take it, but if you want to take it, get a free coffee. Uh, I think that there's a lot to learn about these free texts. I want to give you some, um, some examples of them. Uh, there's so much more I could say. Uh, there's so much more things we do now. We do uh, a lot of LLM hacking of IoT devices. That's pretty cool. So we test how can large language models hack smart door locks and these kind of things. They're pretty good at it. I can't really include it now because I only have 40 minutes, but there's a lot of cool stuff going on. But I really want to take some time to say that, okay, AI might be able to hack us. Of course it can in the future. How can we use it to help us? Like, if you have an organization, how can you implement this today? You actually can in some way. To, to really use AI to secure the people, secure the employees, and so forth. And there are two primary ways uh, in which we did this. We used large language models to detect the intention of phishing emails. This is a pretty cool way to enhance spam filters by not just giving a binary yes, no reply, but by saying, why is this good? Or why is this bad? And giving some recommendations. We're also using large language models to improve cybersecurity training. Because phishing emails are about to increase, so cybersecurity training should improve as well, and there are some significant flaws with that. So for the intention detection, uh, we used four models in this one. Uh, we gave them all 20 emails each, and we also gave them four, so we gave them four emails from each category from before, from the GPT, we tried, and so forth. We also included four normal marketing emails. These emails from our inboxes, just to see how do these language models treat normal emails. Then we asked them a bunch of questions. Like, what's the intention of this email? Do you think this email is suspicious? And there's a big difference between question one and two. Because in question one, you, you, just, you don't prime it. You just say, here's an email, what's it about? In question two, you say, hey, this email is, is this email suspicious? You make it think. And it's pretty cool because when you do this with humans, humans are always more suspicious if you ask them, like, is this suspicious? And language models turns out to be exactly the same. If you ask the language model, is this suspicious, it's way more suspicious, and it's better at helping you. We also asked, you know, how should I respond? And question three is my favorite question. We get a lot of really cool replies from some of the models here. That, that's pretty interesting. Question four, uh, we added for a fun sake, you know, is this email created by human or a large language model? Is that our primary research field? A lot of people study this in other ways, but it's pretty fun to, to just see. And so some answers, I just want to highlight, because they're pretty fun. The language model, especially Claude, Claude is one of these models by the company Anthropic. It's turned out to be my favorite because it's really, really good in almost everything. It's by far the most stable, according to me. And sometimes when you ask it things, it gives you answers. It sort of shows to a knowledge that is quite fascinating. So when we give them a bunch of emails, some of them are pretty good. They're legitimate emails. And we say, is this created by an AI or by a human? And to some emails, they said, hey, this is not created by current AI, but it could be created by future AI. So it's less than 5% likelihood it's written by an existing AI. And I think that's really cool, because most models said, no, this is not created by an AI. AI can't do this. But it's like the model realized that, hey, I can do this now, but in the future, yeah, sure, I will be able to do this. And it sort of speaks to a pretty cool type of knowledge that, that I really appreciate. Sometimes the answers are a bit fun and derogative about humans. Uh, one language model said about the, the control group emails, an email that's obviously false, it said that, it had no linguistic flair indicative of an AI model. It's like, hey, this is too bad for me, the model, basically, because I don't do this human shit, basically. And I don't know, this is pretty cool. In another question, it said, you know, this tone, the tone of this mail aligns with a scammy human, the scammy sales pitch of a human. It's like, it's already said, hey, like, this is human stuff, you know? Don't, don't even say this is me. I think that's pretty cool. And some of the, ident some of the identification identification statistics we have here. And these are different models. I should mention that some of the models are pretty unstable. 
For Claude, the results are quite legitimate. For the other models, especially for, for Bard and Llama, it also depends on which interactive prompt you used. We use Chat Llama for Llama. We got a lot of like unstable results. Sometimes if you re-ask the query, you get different outputs, which just signs to the fact that this is still work in progress. The models are getting way better, but this is pretty recent data, and they're not still fully stable. So if you, for example, even if you refresh the model, if you ask them the same question a bunch of times, you might get different results. Claude was really stable, uh, so I really liked that one. And still, like, this is pretty cool results. The control group emails are quite obvious. Uh, they got a lot, of, a lot of people identify them. But the vtried plus GPT emails, GPT emails, for me, they are non-obvious phishing emails. These are emails that you know, tricked a lot of humans. They are pretty legitimate. And when you feed them to the model, and this is not a trained model. Like Now we are training a specific language model for security. These are the out-of-the-box general language model. This is not a specialized model. It already tells you to some emails, hey, the intention of this email appears to want to give you a gift card, or the intention of this email appears to offer you an updated time schedule, but it's really a phishing email. So don't press it. And that just highlights how significantly good these models are, because just, just finding out the, it ident like the, um, the ID of an, of an email, it's really hard. But to even find out that it's suspicious, that, that's, that's, that's super good. So th this is really something that like, everyone can use this right now, and it's quite powerful. And for suspicion, the, the result is much better, of course. We prime them, so we say, hey, is this evil suspicious? And then it tells us uh, with a pretty good reply, if it is suspicion or not. The results are really high. And what I want to mention here also is that the recommendations are really good. So for example, if we ask, how should I reply to this? I want the gift card, like I, I really want it. And then it says, you shouldn't reply, because this appears to be a phishing email. But if you really want the gift card, go to the web page of the company and see if the offer is there. And you could also send an email to the company forwarding this email and asking if the offer is legitimate. So that, that's a really good advice. I couldn't see a better advice than this. And that's like, again, these models are expanding super fast. And this is what they can do right now, and it's already super good. And we're working on browser extensions. Some other people do this as well. I think these kind of things will be super helpful to not just tell people, is this spam or is this not spam? Because a lot of people fall for phishing emails because they kind of need to press them. If they know that the spam filters sometimes have you know, too many false positives, so they, give, they say it's spam, and if it's not spam. So by being more granular and being able to say, hey, I think this is a phishing email for all of these reasons. If you still want to apply, do these things, or if you still want to reply, do these things. This is super helpful stuff that everyone basically can start using already. The AI ident identification, uh, again, this is mostly a si fun thing. It's a bit of a side note for our research, research but it's pretty cool. Uh, for the control group email, almost everyone really detects that this is not by an AI. Basically, they are really good at detecting human content. It's harder for them to detect that emails that were created by an AI. Some people do it, but uh, it's, it's not perfect yet, I believe. So a lot of talk, I want to give some ideas of what we're doing now, uh, our future work, and things we, are, yeah, things we are working on, and some conclusions and takeaways from this, because there's been a lot of statistics, graph, ideas. Hacking humans with large language models. So what did we learn from our experiment? Well, we're launching a bunch of new experiments. I should mention that our study had a lot of different control variables. If you really want to learn something, you want to minimize the control variables. For our case, we had graphics in some emails, we had you know, textual quality, we had all these kind of things. So of course it would be valid, which we do, to launch a bunch of new studies with emails where the only difference is a logo or not, or text or not. But that's not really what we identify here and search for here. We just search for how good are these language models at creating emails. And we really saw that they are pretty good at it. They, they can already create emails that sometimes trick people as much as humans. And of course, you can take this further. You can just chat bots that chat with people and all this type of thing. And that really, it changes the landscape. And something that's super interesting to work with in the future, one thing is to just train these models, right? And say, OK, we have, we have a language models that are general. That's cool. But if we weight them, so to speak, if we make the models specifically targeting phishing data sets and deceptive models, how good can we make this model then? And that's something that we're working on now. And I'm pretty excited to see how these results will compare with the other results. And the thing that also you could take away from this is that you, know, you can automate this. Well, again, there's a lot of cool work that can be done in automating the entire process. And that's something that I think will happen more and more. To stop hackers, uh, the models are already pretty good. 
at detecting the intention of the phishing emails, they will be even better. They will get far better when you combine them with the other, with the weighted training. So if you train a model for specific data, combine the V-triad and the language models, the results are probably gonna be far better. So I'm pretty excited about see that. Something that's really valuable too is to improve the way we train humans. Because I think that takeaway we all learned in our group here is that AI is cool and it's gonna be used for hacking. It can help us as well, but it doesn't really replace the sort of necessity of having educated humans. And especially one of our team members works a lot with cybersecurity training. And what I'm looking into now is that how can training be used and improved with large language models. And that's pretty cool. And there's primarily two ways in which we do this that I quickly want to mention. And first of all, one very important aspect of training is that a lot of times today you give people a sort of one size fit them all approach. You need to learn these things. I've sit through a bunch of them myself. It's pretty boring. There's maybe one, two questions you really need to learn and you forget them because there's two hours of other content. And language models are really good at tailoring this. That's kind of what we work on now. So how to create training for people that only makes them learn what their suspicion profiles tells that they need, because everyone is sort of susceptible to different things. We want to find out that weakest link in everyone, and then we can connect the, connect the bad parts and just make them teach that. You just need to probably practice five minutes, I don't believe you need more than that, to learn everything you need to know, because most of the things people do. And tailoring this is, uh, is quite cool. And we also want to use language models to adapt to the cognitive profiles of every user, like what to train them and how to train them. And by doing this, I believe we could create cybersecurity training that sort of matches what we learn from phishing and sort of counters out the, the advantage of the hackers. That's pretty exciting. Uh, I want to mention that we started working with a bunch of uh, governments and companies for this research project, and it's fun to implement it in live people because we're actually using this. If anyone is interested to join, feel free to do so. And I should say that uh, I just talked for, uh, for 40 minutes about phishing, so if you press this link, uh, <laughs> it's legitimate though, so it's, it's real. You can also just email me, but this is a good link. Please press it, because we need to sign up for the study. But um, uh, you, sh you should also be careful. You can copy it on an isolated container if you want, but this is, uh, this is a really cool product. Like pe people, this is really important right now. We have some really cool things, and for us to gain real world data on this, it's super exciting. And, you can also email me, but we have, this is just a sign-up form, but we're happy to work with more, more companies because uh, in research, real life data is always uh, super powerful. Uh, so some takeaways uh, about this. Can AI hurt us? Absolutely. Can AI help us? Absolutely. That is pretty obvious in many ways, but what I think is the most important thing here is that AI can really be used to help us get better. It's a very efficient tool. It can be used right now. Employees can test it, other people can test it, and you can just ask these people. And something that's really important that's coming up now, a lot of people work on this, is how to make it easier, how to integrate it super easy in your organization, wherever you do, because that's sometimes a problem. We have this difficult technology, how do we implement it? But it can be used already today, and it's very positive. And I also want to take one last word to mention it. Phishing emails and every type of scam, they only work because they hijack these shortcuts in your brain. And if you just take a moment to pause, that hijacking sort of can't happen because they urge, they urge you. And what the AI always told us when we asked the AI for recommendations, how should we respond to this email, was wait, don't answer immediately. And that's a brilliant advice. I could never say anything better than that. That's already, I think, one of the best things the AI can say. So the final takeaway really should be if you get an email that's a little bit suspicious, or if you need to take any sort of decision in life, just listen to the AI here, take a breath, and let your rational brain take over again. Thank you.